Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the mailbag installment here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campia. I'm the uh, editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News, and I'm so glad you decided to spend part of this Saturday here with us. Uh, and uh, like I said in the title, and this is the show where all we do is take your mailbag questions. And listen, if you've got a question you would like us to address on either this show, AMC Mailbag, or on AMC Movie Talk Monday through Friday, email us your questions anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Now, we do get like over 1,000 emails every week. Uh, so we obviously, and we only have time to get to about 30 or 40 of them. So don't be discouraged if your question doesn't get asked. Um, but uh, we do our best to get through as many as we can. And today I'm going to, I need to try to get through like eight or something. I'm going to try to get through like 10 or 11 questions today uh, to see what we can do. Um, so, but I want to remind you guys that, um, tomorrow night, that's Sunday night, the 17th, um, is the annual Geeky Awards. Um, and the Geeky Awards are being held at the Avalon Theater in Hollywood, California. And, uh, AMC Movie Talk is actually nominated for Best Podcast or Vlog. Uh, and we're really, really excited about it. Uh, we're going to be there and you can actually watch the show live tomorrow night, that's Sunday the 17th at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's Los Angeles time. So I believe that's 10 p.m. on the East Coast. You can watch the show live starting at 7 p.m. at twitch.tv slash the Geeky Awards. So that's twitch.tv slash the Geeky Awards. And there's going to be a live stream of that uh, tomorrow night. And you guys can tune in and maybe watch us win our second award this year or... Uh, you can watch us lose, and then you can send in tons of email to, uh, uh, you know, pick, pick me up after my crushing defeat at the at the Geekies. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. So please tune in. Uh, it'd be really cool if you guys watch the show. Uh, anyway, like I said, we're going to get to mailbag questions, and we're not going to waste any more time. We're going to jump right into it. So let's get on to question number one. And the first question today comes to us from Jesse Vargas, who writes. Hey, AMC, love the show and never miss an episode. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. My question is about Edge of Tomorrow. Do you think it's a good idea for Warner Brothers to change the title to Live, Die, Repeat before it's released on DVD and Blu-ray later this year? Personally, I think the studio should have stayed with its original title, All You Need Is Kill. Thanks, and keep up with the good work. Well, thank you so much for the question, Jesse. And it's so funny. Yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, Friday, on AMC Movie Talk, Somebody wrote in a question and asked, who I think it was one of the live Twitter questions, and asked, hey guys, did you hear, what do you think about, you know, Warner Brothers changing the title of uh, Edge of Tomorrow to Live, Die, Repeat? And I had seen the box art, the Blu-ray box art for uh, Edge of Tomorrow, and I'll bring it up here. And I had seen this picture, and as he says, Live, Die, Repeat, and that's always kind of been the, the, the slogan of the film, Live, Die, Repeat. But at the bottom, you see that it says Cruise, Blunt, Edge of Tomorrow. So somebody tweeted in to the live show yesterday and said, what do you think about them changing the title of the film to Live, Die, Repeat? And I was like, oh, silly viewer, silly, silly viewer. They didn't change the name of the movie. That's just the box art. Let me bring it up again. That's just the box art. Lots of box art. This is not uncommon for a DVD or a Blu-ray release to have its box art come out and have something other than the title of the film be dominant on the cover. And um, so I said, look, it's Live, Die, Repeat. That's just the slogan. But you see at the bottom there, it says a cruise blunt edge of tomorrow. The movie's still called Edge of Tomorrow. You silly, silly viewer. No, so naive thinking they changed the name of the movie. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Well... Turns out, they did change the name of the movie. Because I believe I had a lot of people uh, uh, notify me that, hey, actually, if you go to the iTunes store, and I think on Amazon uh, as well, the movie is actually listed as Live, Die, Repeat, colon, Edge of Tomorrow. So apparently, the new title of the film is Live, Die, Repeat, Edge of Tomorrow. That's the new, It's not Edge of Tomorrow anymore. Now it's Live, Die, Repeat, Edge of Tomorrow. That's the new, uh, you know, the new title of the film. <laughs> Silly viewer. And I look like a jackass again. Um, 
Yeah, because I had seen the box art that morning. I thought, oh, it's just a you know a different take on the box art. And I actually thought the box art looked pretty good. And you know, I don't norm we don't normally talk about home video releases after a movie's left the theaters, but since it came up yesterday, I thought I should address this. I was dead wrong. Me and the rest of the crew, we were dead wrong. Now it turns out they did actually change the title of the movie. And I'm not just bringing it up here on AMC Movie Talk or on AMC Mailbag just to point out the fact that I was wrong about that yesterday. I, I gotta say this. Look, we all know that, you know, Edge of Tomorrow didn't do so bad at the box office. It didn't do horrible. It started off weak. But as the word of mouth started to get out about the film, that this movie that looks terrible, because I'm on record, I've said it is probably the worst marketing campaign, the most botched marketing campaign for a film I have ever seen, that I have personally ever seen. They so misrepresented that movie and made that movie look like a big piece of existential voyage into the mind. This is not the end. It's, it's, just, it's this introspective, philosophical, you know, journey into the soul of the eye. You know, that's what these trailers look like. And, and the movie looks stupid. It looked like a bad version of Oblivion, and Oblivion was already pretty damn bad on its own. And that's what it looked like. It looked like an Oblivion sequel. And it just looked horrible. They botched that campaign. Because I went to go see the movie, and I've, we talked about this on the show before, but I went to go see that movie, and holy crap, it was nothing like the trailers. It was fun, and it was funny, and it was high energy, high octane. It was it was creative. It was not the movie they made it look like in their mar- their botched marketing campaign. It was a damn good summer film. And I applaud them for it. They did a terrific job making that film. But they did one of the worst jobs in history of marketing it. And that is a film that, while positive word of mouth slowly started to get out, and it ended up doing okay... That is a movie that should have done much better at the box office and would have done much better at the box office had they not botched it. Now, the botching of the marketing for Edge of Tomorrow, and I have a point to all this, the botching of the marketing for Edge of Tomorrow started long before the trailers came out, right? That movie was supposed to be called All You Need Is Kill. That is a, I mean, based on the, the original, that is a great title, That is a memorable title. That is a title you don't forget. Instead, you know, about a year before release. (coughs) Pardon me, guys. I still have that cough. Um, That's why I've got, like, candy in my mouth. Instead, about a year before the release, they announced they changed the name to some generic piece of crap Monday afternoon soap opera daytime sounding title, Edge of Tomorrow. Like, doesn't that sound like a daytime soap opera title? Edge of Tomorrow. I mean, it was a, it's a stupid title. It's a bad title. Especially when the title was All You Need Is Kill. Super memorable, super cool, sticks in the consciousness. is great. So they changed the Edge of Tomorrow. Whatever. We all rolled our eyes when they changed the title. But then the marketing, terrible marketing, blah, blah, blah. But you'd think. So Edge of Tomorrow comes out in theaters slowly the word gets out that, hey, forget the trailers. This movie is really damn good. This is a good movie. You should go and see it. So people started to warm up to it and started to go to see it, and the word started to spread that it was a pretty darn good movie. And you'd think that just when you thought that Warner Brothers now could no longer possibly screw up this movie anymore, they could not possibly screw up the marketing of this movie anymore, I should say. Just when you think that that's the case. And I gotta say, Warner Brothers, this is really shocking to me because there are very few studios out there who do what they do as well as Warner Brothers does. Eh, I've had some frustration with them about their how they handle their DC properties and their comic book properties. Granted, but overall, Warner Brothers is one of the best studios in the business. And I really like the way they... They, uh, they mostly do things. They're a great studio. That's why this became it was such a shock to me. So, the movie finishes its theatrical run, and you think, 
okay, they can't possibly screw this up anymore. The, the marketing of it. The marketing can't possibly screw this up anymore. And then, what did we find out yesterday? Well, now for their VOD, home video, Blu-ray, whatever release, they've changed the name of the film to Live, Die, Repeat, Edge of Tomorrow. Just when you finally got people to warm, after people finally got over that horrible marketing campaign and all the terrible decisions you made regarding this film, people were finally warming up to this movie, discovering this movie, hearing from word of mouth about how good this movie is and developing an interest in the movie. As now people start to associate, oh, I should really check out it. Hey, I missed my opportunity when it was in theaters, which is too bad. As I've always said, take it with a grain of salt because I work with AMC. But if you've followed me since my movie blog days, you know I've always said this. The only best way to watch a movie is in a theater. But, hey, we missed our theatrical window. Can't wait to check this movie out on home video when it comes out because now everybody's talking about how good it is. Now you've got some positive buzz about this film. you got people talking about this film. And what do you do? You change the title. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here, and I'm not going to say that. Oh my gosh, changing the title is going to completely tank this the, the home video portion of this movie's uh, shelf life. I'm not saying that at all. It may not have a very big impact at all, as a matter of fact. But it would be naive to think that it's not going to have any negative impact. It's going to create a bit of confusion. Um, it, it's it, like you finally have people associating good thoughts with that title. And you had to get over that horrible marketing campaign at first. But now you got people thinking good thoughts, positive thoughts, positive reinforcement when they think about Edge of Tomorrow coming out on home video. Let's confuse the whole thing and change the title. I am baffled. Absolutely baffled how Warner Brothers could allow something so stupid. Now, if this was, I won't mention names, but if this was one or two other studios that was doing this, I wouldn't be all that surprised. Like, yeah, that studio has a track record of doing some really questionable and crazy, stupid things. Like I said, Warner Brothers, they are really smart people over there. Really smart people over there. And how they continue to botch and mishandle um, Edge of Tomorrow is, is shocking to me. All I can figure is that some president, some division president or some senior vice president over there has some really underachieving moron nephew that they had to give a job to. And said, hey, how about you oversee our Edge of Tomorrow marketing? Okay, Uncle Rick. Edge of Tomorrow. <laughs> I don't understand what all you mean is kill means. Let's change it to Edge of Tomorrow. Wait, wait, six months later. Second thought. Let's change it to Live, Die, Repeat. How about that, Uncle Rick? That's a, I don't know who I'm trying to do an impersonation of there. Whatever it is, it's terrible. I admit that. But it's really, it's really, really... And you know, I wouldn't care. And I shouldn't care. I wouldn't care if this was a movie I didn't I, that I thought was just a piece of crap throwaway movie anyway. Fact of the matter is, I feel kind of defensive for Edge of Tomorrow because it's as crappy as it looked. I, it ended up being one of those movies that I really enjoyed and I started cheering for and rooting for and I wanted to see it succeed. And it's starting to succeed a little bit despite every attempt that Warner Brothers seems to be taking to sabotage its own success. I'm just flabbergasted by it. And I look, I, am, am I ascribing too much importance to this title change? Maybe. Maybe. Like I say, th this isn't going to sink the home video run or success or failure or whatever of, of the home video release of Edge of Tomorrow. I'm sorry, live, die, repeat Edge of Tomorrow. It's not, it's not going to make or break the thing. But I do think it's going to have a bit of a negative impact. And it's just shocking to me that they would do something this stupid. And, and to me, it really is stupid. But you know what? Maybe maybe you're somebody who saw this news. Maybe you're somebody who saw like Maybe you're like me and you saw the movie and you liked it. <coughs> and you saw this news about the title change. And you think, ah, this is a good idea. And maybe you got some really good reasons for thinking that. I would love to hear them. Jump in the comments section of the video and, and lay out um, why you think this is actually a good move uh, on their part. I would love to hear it because I'll be honest with you. The last 24 hours, all I can think about is all the, the, the negative things about this move. 
All I can see are the reasons why this is a stupid move. And I haven't really been able to conjure up any good reasons why they would make this move, but maybe you have. And that's the great thing about being the sons and daughters of AMC collectively so we can share ideas. So please, by all means, jump in the comment section. Let me know your thoughts about um, why you th also think this is a stupid move or why you think this is a good move and list off your reasons. I'd love to hear them. All right, spend enough time on that. Let's move on to question number two. And question number two today comes to us from Justin Napich, who writes... Hey guys and gals of AMC, longtime fan from way back. Well, thank you so much, Justin. First, I want to say thank you for being part of my daily routine. Well, well, thank you so much for making us part of your daily routine. Anyway, since Star Wars Episode 7 is coming into theaters, do you think they will re-release the originals in theaters, Episodes 4, 5, and 6? In other words, Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi? I would think it would be great for people that never experienced them, and also for the ones that have. On top of most likely bringing him some great money, what do you guys think? Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for the question, Justin. Um, could not possibly agree with you more. Could not possibly agree with you more. I think the last time the original, uh, any of the original trilogy films were in theater was like back in ninety six, ninety seven. I could be mistaken about that, but I think that's it. Um re-releasing the original Star Wars trilogy into theaters prior to the release of Star Wars Episode Seven is, is brilliant on several levels. On the first level, it'll give a lot of people who never had the glorious experience of going to watch a, star, a true Star Wars movie. A true Star Wars movie. And there are only three. Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi. It'll give a lot of people who've never had the the opportunity to, to experience a true Star Wars movie on the big screen in a theater where it was meant to be seen with a huge audience together, blah, blah, blah. It's a wonderful idea to prime everybody and get everybody excited again for the new films that are coming. Uh, so on that level, I just think it's a great idea. But also, it's brilliant from a business point of view. <clears throat> and from a business point of view, like, wait a minute, all we got to do, we don't have to produce any new movie. We just got to take this movie that's already there, put a little bit of money into marketing, put it back in theater, and make tens of millions of dollars. It makes gr perfect sense. Perfect sense. And using the re-release, the hype surrounding the re-release of the original trilogy, not the special editions, but to re-release the original trilogy back into theater that just helps you hype up and build up enthusiasm for the upcoming Star Wars Episode Seven. Um, now look, I don't have the decision-making power at AMC. And I hope the heads of AMC are watching this. Because I should have this power. Come to think of it, I should have all power. But that's besides the point. Um, I do not have the decision-making power, uh, thankfully for AMC. I do not have the decision-making power to go to, to go to AMC and say, make this happen. Um, but I, I can tell you this, working with a lot of the guys at AMC, especially uh, the, um, the special programming department, uh, which does just some amazing stuff. We have a department that's just in charge of like special programming, which is the non just major film releases, anything else that we do outside of that. And they are some great and some very smart people that head up that department for us. Um, and while I have not talked to them about this yet, I would be shocked. I would be shocked if I found out that this isn't already being discussed in the uh, AMC boardrooms. Um, <coughs> and the Lucasfilm boardrooms. And the Disney boardrooms. And all over the place. I'm sure this is being talked about, discussed. Because there is just no downside. There is no downside. Now, you don't release the prequels. Because that will turn people off a of Star Wars Episode Seven, But you release the glorious original trilogy. It'll just hype up Episode 7. It'll reintroduce people to, to the films that they, they've maybe never had a chance to see on the big screen again. And it just generates some free extra money. Because uh, I know they'll get a lot of mine. <coughs> I'll be there. I'll be there to watch it again. So, uh, yeah, I, I got to say, Justin, I think you're, to use a Charlie, the, an overused Charlie Sheenism, uh, Justin, I just think your idea is completely full of win. Uh, and they should absolutely do it. All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question today comes to us from Jason I. And Jason I writes, correct me if I'm wrong, 
But I remember John saying that he considers two of the top three male acting performances to be Daniel Day-Lewis in There Will Be Blood and Colin Firth in The King's Speech. My question is, what about the third actor? Um, thanks a lot for the question, Jason. And let me correct you. You're, you're a little bit off there. Um, <clears throat> I do consider the performance of Daniel Day-Lewis in There Will Be Blood to be amongst, probably in the top three, of the greatest acting performances ever. I do. Now, but I don't consider Colin Firth's performance in uh, The King's Speech to be in that top three. What I did say was that um, Colin Firth's performance, I believe, was the best male performance we've seen since Daniel Day-Lewis um, in There Will Be Blood. And and I, I kind of still believe that. I, I still... What Colin Firth did in The King's Speech to me was just remarkable. Especially when you consider that he was acting alongside Jeffrey Rush, who was just on his A-game as well. Um, and when if you're acting beside Jeffrey Rush when he's on his A-game, you run the potential of looking really stupid and looking very bad in comparison. But instead, Colin Firth really showed us what he's made of and just elevated his, his gift um, <clears throat> to levels that... Like I said, I don't think we had seen since Daniel Day-Lewis in There Will Be Blood. I, I'm not going to sit here and, and try to come up with what I think are the three greatest performances of all time because all that will do is generate a lot of hate mail. But I'm going to tell you what my three favorites are. These are my three favorites. Um, in no particular order. Um, I've already mentioned the Daniel Day-Lewis in There Will Be Blood. That performance just absolutely astounded me, stunned me, whatever you know word you want to use. It was just incredible. Another one, which is also fairly recent, is Russell Crowe in A Beautiful Mind. Now, Russell Crowe had already won an Oscar for Gladiator in 2001. And so he had his Oscar. But it, this was around the time that people started getting tired of Russell Crowe. Especially, you know, he was acting... I like Russell Crowe. I've met him a couple times and I, I get along with him quite well, to be honest with you. But there is no denying that he has acted in certain ways sometimes that, that have given off the impression to a lot of people that he might be something of a jackass. <clears throat> hey, I'm just calling it like it is. I like the guy. But he has had some incidents um, where he has caused himself to look like a jackass to a lot of people. And I think a lot of people were getting tired of Russell Crowe by the time A Beautiful Mind came out. There was also some controversy surrounding A Beautiful Mind and it's a, it, it, that it whitewashed the character a little bit because the real life character may not have been as noble as, as they portrayed him in the movie and all that kind of stuff, but that's all irrelevant. Fact of the matter is, I think that performance by Russell Crowe in A Beautiful Mind is one of the all-time great performances. And um, But because of all the reasons I listed, <clears throat> he didn't get the Academy Award. He got nominated, but he didn't get the Academy Award that year. They instead gave it to Denzel Washington. And all due respect to Denzel Washington. But Denzel Washington probably did not deserve an Oscar for his performance in Training Day. Was he good in it? Absolutely he was. But let's be honest, it's not even one of Denzel Washington's top three performances. We've seen Denzel Washington, in all of his brilliance, give better performances than he gave in Training Day. Um, and I, I don't even know that Training Day, his performance in Training Day, I don't even know that was one of the top three performances that year. But... Um, but hey, you know, it doesn't always go the way that I think it should go. But I really honestly do feel like everybody's um, being irked at Russell Crowe around that time had a lot to do with him not winning because that performance, I believe, is one of the best ever. Um, and I said it was in no particular order, but probably my favorite uh, male lead performance of all time, uh, Peter O'Toole in Lawrence of Arabia. I mentioned that um, on AMC Movie Talk when um, Peter Toole passed away. Yeah, his performance in, in Lawrence of Arabia has kind of become the measuring stick for me, I think, when I watch a movie. When I watch a movie with a great male lead performance, I, it, it's like subconsciously my mind instantly goes to a place of how does this performance measure up to the Peter O'Toole standard that he set for me in Lawrence of Arabia. Now, a lot of different people will have a different list. That's the great thing about lists, right? Like, we're all going to have different lists. Everybody's list will look different. And there are some very, very good performances that could be in anybody's top three favorites. And right now, remember, I'm not saying these are the definitive top three best performances of all time. I'm simply saying these are my three personal favorite performances. Daniel Day-Lewis um, in There Will Be Blood. Russell Crowe 
in A Beautiful Mind, Peter O'Toole in Lawrence of Arabia. And <clears throat> I could sit here and list, you know, if those are the number one, two, and three for me. I could sit here and list 20 other performances that would be 4, 4A, 4B, 4C, 4D, 4E, and on and on and on and on and on. Because there are some just magnificent performances we've had over the years. But those are my three personal favorites. And thank you so much for the question. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us. Uh, oh, th this person did not include their name. So they simply wrote, Hi, AMC Movie Crew. I love your show. Godzilla 2014 was my favorite summer movie this year. And I am more than happy that it is getting a trilogy. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. They're, they're <coughs> they may have plans for a trilogy, but we're going to have to see how Godzilla 2 does. So let's not get ahead of ourselves with the trilogy. Anyway, I just recently heard that Godzilla 2 got a release date for June 8th, 2018. My question is, do you guys think that the relatively weak word of mouth is what caused the movie to plummet over 66% at the box office in its second weekend? Thank you so much for the question. Um, <clears throat> here's the thing. One of the key indicators about how people really responded to a film is how much of a drop-off will it have from its first weekend at the box office to its second weekend at the box office. Now, the average, you, you got to expect, you know, 50 to 55% of a drop because more and more, uh, people, if they're going to go see a movie, they generally go to see it opening weekend. That's when, compared to all other weeks, a movie makes most of its money uh, in, in week one than it will in any other week of its existence. So you expect uh, a fairly, you know, a significant drop-off, roughly, you know, um, 55%, 55 to 60%. I mean, if you have a movie that only drops like, say, 40% from week one to week two, that's huge. Like that's that's something you get excited about and something you write home about. Um, Godzilla dropped like sixty six percent from week one to week two, which is kind of high. That's kind of a high drop off. But <clears throat> there is one really big extenuating circumstance there regarding Godzilla's drop off from week one to week two, and that is that on Godzilla's second weekend was the opening for X-Men Days of Future Past. So, when you look at how much Godzilla dropped, in this circumstance, and this happens with some other films too, you always have to take into consideration what opened on that film's second weekend. And in this case, you have Godzilla opening one week, and then on its second weekend, X-Men Days of Future Past opens up. Well, look, um, there is a lot of crossover in the demographic between Godzilla and X-Men Days of Future Past. They were There's a big chunk of the audience that both of those films were going to appeal to and attract to. They, they, they weren't 100% appealing to the same audience. It's not like Captain America Winter Soldier opened up one week and then X-Men opened up the next week and they were both 100% going after the same audience. Godzilla has a little bit of a unique audience and so does X-Men Days of Future Past from each other. But there's a big you know overlap of audience there. And so, uh, when X-Men Days of Future Past opened up, you have to expect that a film that is kind of going after the same audience in its second week is going to take a major hit. Because a lot of those people who may have gone to see Godzilla on its second weekend, instead you got X-Men Days of Future Past now on its opening weekend and everybody wanted to rush out to see it. So to be honest with you, as, a, as somebody who liked, I know there were people out there who did not like Godzilla. I did, personally. But as somebody who liked Godzilla, I got to tell you that I was actually kind of pleasantly surprised that it only dropped by 66%, considering X-Men Days of Future Past was opening up the very next week. Now, normally you wouldn't say, wow, it only dropped 66%. That's a significant drop. That's a big drop. And normally you'd be very concerned about that. But I think when you take into consideration the fact that X-Men Days of Future Past opened up the very next week. I think you have to have that in consideration. And that's one of the big reasons that it dropped so much. So to be honest, I'm not concerned about it. <coughs> All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question comes to us from Ben Goddick, who writes, Hey, everybody. Love me or hate me for this. But I was thinking for either Star Wars or Batman v Superman, if they didn't release any trailers or footage... Would they still make roughly the same amount of money anyway? 
even if you did a teaser or something with a just a font that says be ready because let's face it we are what if they publicized it differently could it be a game changer for marketing why or why not um thanks a lot for the question ben and and hey full marks to you for kind of thinking outside of the box on this we some of us joke around sometimes about certain movies say oh man you didn't even have to put out a trailer for that and it was still going to make a hundred million dollars opening weekend star wars batman v superman all that kind of stuff and so what ben is asking is probably just a logical extension of a question that a lot of us have asked hypothetically in conversations around the water cooler hey do they even need to put out a big marketing campaign for star wars do they even need to put out a big marketing campaign for batman versus superman because let's face it so many people are looking forward to these movies anyway and look the marketing machine and with studios now is huge look it is not unusual it is not super rare that some movies that studios put out actually cost more to market than it did to make the films that's not rare it happens because you're talking about 20 30 40 50 60 million dollars in some cases marketing campaigns for films sometimes the films that only cost 15 to 20 to 30 million dollars to even make in the first place so ben is asking a very logical question that being said yeah you you still have to do that marketing campaign you absolutely do look i often talk about um this bubble effect that a lot of us seem to feel we feel sometimes and i have this discussion a lot with friends of mine who are fans of batman beyond all right and i don't mean to get into a big batman beyond debate again i'm just going to use it as an example okay um so you get some people who are into batman beyond and think they should make a batman beyond movie which i think is a bad idea and there are others who think it's a good idea fair enough just difference of opinion whatever but the thing is what i find is that these people uh, these friends of mine who who think they should do a batman beyond movie they say everybody wants a batman beyond movie man it would be huge it would be big and i say dude nobody watched batman beyond when it was on it only lasted like a couple of very small number of seasons next if i and my argument is if i stand in front of amc theaters next week and wait for all the movies to come out and i ask 1000 people throughout the night as they leave excuse me sir do you know what batman beyond is I'm telling you right now, 90% of them will go, mm, no, no, no. But because certain friends of mine have a circle of friends where they're all fans of Batman Beyond, their perception of the world around them is that everybody knows and loves Batman Beyond. Everybody knows and loves Batman Beyond. It's going to be big. It's going to be huge because them and their circle of friends their world uh, really embraces it and knows it and all that kind of stuff I, I think the bubble effect is also there for a lot of us who are interested in film in general you know all of my friends are chomping at the bit to see batman versus superman all of my friends are chomping at the bit to see the new star wars because frankly if you're not chomping at the bit to see the new star wars you and I basically can't be friends. I'm sorry. We just can't. Um, I remember when I was dating Anne, and uh, I discovered it was almost, it would almost change my life. This is one of pivotal moments in history. Uh, because I remember I was dating Anne for a little bit, and I was starting to really like her. And so we started talking, about, I started talking about Star Wars this one time. I said, you know that one scene in Empire Strikes Back, and you know when the Ewoks do this? She goes, oh, actually, I've never seen the Star Wars movies. Almost ended the relationship. You think I'm kidding. You think I'm telling some kind of joke. The sad thing is, I'm not telling some kind of joke. I honestly think, I honestly thought to myself, it's like, oh damn, that's too bad. This this relationship was going so well. And I actually thought, I can't, I can't be with a girl that does not know and adore and love Star Wars. It can't work. Sorry, baby. It ain't gonna work. Um... But she instantly followed that up with, I've always wanted to watch them, though. And I'm like, okay, 
Okay, we may have just saved this. We, we might have just saved this. And I remember watching the original trilogy with her and kind of, as she's watching the movie, I'm like watching her face. Making sure, trying to read if she's enjoying, because if she doesn't like the Star Wars, I, ew, where can we go? There's nothing, there's, no more, there's nothing left for us to talk about, honey. Um, anyway, so fortunately she knows and loves it. So I got off on a big rabbit trail. So everybody I know is chomping at the bit and dying to see Batman versus Superman. Everybody I know, all my friends, my family, everybody I know is dying to see Star Wars Episode 7. But we must still keep our wits about us to understand that that's just my bubble. That the majority of the people out there are not as fanatical about films as me and the people I know and my friends. And it is those people that marketing campaigns need to target and go after because they represent the majority. Remember, I believe I read, now I go to see one, anywhere between one and 200. There was one year I saw like close to 300, but I see a couple hundred films every year. A lot of the friends I know go to about 40 or 50 films a year. But if I remember studies correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong if you know this is different, please write it in the comment section. I, I'm just, if I'm remembering this right, I believe the average American goes to see three to four films a year. And that body of people, that huge pot of people that go to see three to four, maybe five films a year, maybe they'll go every couple of months, they'll go to the movie theater and check a movie out. They are the richest pool out there. That is the biggest pool. That is your biggest market out there. And it's those people that you have to attract into your theater. It is from that pool of people. It's like Marvel understands, hey, look, we put out Guardians of the Galaxy, a Marvel film. We can count on this amount of people going because they're already fans of Marvel. They're big into comic book movies. They're going to come out and see this. They understand that. We can count on that. But we got to put this, but that only represents a certain fraction of the money that we want to make on this film. So we need to start putting together a marketing campaign to go after that huge body of people that only go to see a movie every three months, every four months. We need them coming to our movie. And if you put out Batman versus Superman tomorrow with no trailers, no marketing, no hype machine, I'm going to be there and everybody I know is going to be there, but the majority of people won't be there. That's, that's just the way it is. You know, the people like my cousin, I've got a, a cousin, Paul, uh, up in Canada and I, I don't know that he's ever gone to the movies, to be honest with you. <laughs> I just, I just don't know. My brother, Rob, um, I, I, I don't, I don't know that he goes to the movies. I mean, when I, I my last trip up to Canada, uh, around Christmas time, I took my brother and my mom <coughs> and a couple of people to the movies. And I think it might've been his first time in the theater in like eight months, but it's people like my brother. It's people like my cousin. It's people like that, that these marketing campaigns have to be put together for to go after, to get them to come to the movies because they will represent the lion's share of the box office. And the more you can get those people to come to your movies, the more money your movie will make. <coughs> and movies like um, Batman v Superman, movies like Star Wars Episode Seven, these are movies that need to make big box office. And to do that, you got to not only get the people who are already excited, and that's a lot of us. You got to go after those people who only go to three or four movies a year because, damn it, you want your film to be one of those three to four, and maybe get them turned on to make that five or six a year. So, um, no, it would not be a good idea or change the game if you suddenly stop doing a big marketing push for a lot of these temple projects and just put out a teaser that said, "Are you ready?" with a Batman symbol. I think it would they would take a major, major hit. But once again, I'd love to, I'm, I'm not the definitive expert on this. That's just my opinion. Jump in the comments section. Let me know what you think. I want to hear what your thoughts are on this. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Jonathan Bell, who writes, Hey guys, if Expendables 3 doesn't do as, as, uh, even this, as, do as good as even the second Expendables film, could this be the end of the series? 
<coughs> well, uh, Jonathan, great question. I think this is the end of the series. Um, there has been talks that they're already planning Expendables 4, but that was before the box office numbers started to come in. Now, look, I I'm recording this. It's Saturday morning, um, so we don't have the full weekend box office, but they do have the Friday numbers, and they are disappointing. Right now, as a result of the Friday numbers, they are projecting that Expendables 3 on its opening weekend is going to come in fourth place. Uh, it's going to be probably be beat by Let's Be Cops. Right now, they are projecting that Expendables 3 will make $16 million on its opening weekend. 16. That is a 44% drop from the opening weekend of Expendables 2. So you had Expendables 2 its opening weekend, now you got Expendables 3, and it drops 44% from the Expendables 2 opening. That's not good. That's not good at all. Um, and now, now some people say, well, John, there was this report of an HD copy of Expendables 3 uh, that got out online weeks before the movie came out. Yeah, did, did that heard it yeah but once again don't be that person living in that bubble that thinks just because you and your buddy knew to go you could go and download that 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 the vast vast majority of people could as well they didn't um and i don't think it had that big of an impact to be honest with you i really don't there are some people who thinks oh that's gonna kill expendable street i really don't think it had that much of an impact um on it, myself personally i think um this result kind of seals the fate of Ex the Expendables franchise. I think the Expendables franchise is done. Um, you know, people generally don't seem to be liking this Expendables as much as they like the second one. They certainly didn't go out to see it. Like I said, a 44% drop from the opening weekend of the second Expendables. So people aren't interested and they're not responding to this Expendables as well as they did to the second one. I really like Expendables too. But... Uh, yeah, I, it's a great question, Jonathan, but I think the answer is I, I believe that the Expendables franchise is now done. That's just my opinion. Sylvester Stallone may not care about the box office results. He may be willing to finance everything anyway. But uh, from a general standpoint, and this was any other movie, yeah, you'd be seeing that Expendables is pretty much finished. All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question today comes to us from Kevin Serrano, who writes, Hi, everyone. This show is awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. So are you. I've been watching it for over three months now. Very addicting. I've been thinking how would a Justice League film be if Christopher Nolan directed it? And which legendary directors, Alfred Hitchcock, Martin Scorsese, Stanley Kubrick, David Lynch, etc., would you have liked to helm a superhero film? Thank you, and keep bringing the goods. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. You know, it's funny. About a year ago, I talked about this. Um, everybody knows how big of a Christopher Nolan fan I am. Memento, Insomnia, The Prestige, uh, Inception, on and on. I don't even, I mean, Batman Begins, The Dark Knight. I wasn't so big on The Dark Knight Rises, but even that's, to me, that's his worst film. To me, The Dark Knight Rises is Christopher Nolan's worst film. And even that, I thought, was pretty good. That says something. When you got a director where you say, okay, this movie is his worst movie, and even that's at least pretty good. I mean, I think Christopher Nolan's... I, I still say Steven Spielberg is the greatest director of all time. But Christopher Nolan's worst film, I think, is way better than Steven Spielberg's worst film. So put that in perspective for a second. So I'm a huge fan of Christopher Nolan. But I said a year ago, and I still believe this, while Christopher Nolan's style... and Look, he clearly has a very definitive style. If you watch Inception, Insomnia, Memento, Prestige, Batman Begins, you, you watch all these films and he has a very distinct tone um, that he does. Personally, I think for Nolan to ever start to be considered amongst the greats, like top 15 directors of all time, I think for him to get into that conversation, I think he needs to put out something that shows that he can diversify a bit that he can do more than just one tone, that he can do more than just one style. Uh, and how good does Interstellar look? 
I wasn't a fan of the first Interstellar trailer, but holy crap, the second Interstellar trailer sold me. I'm all in on Interstellar. Like I wasn't all in already, but how good does that movie look? <clears throat> but once again, it very much feels like that same tone, um, that, that, that same temperature, if you will, of all of his other films. I would really love to see Christopher Nolan break out of that box a little bit and try telling a story with a different tone. Scorsese's done it. Spielberg has done it. All the greats. Uh, Kubrick, not as much, but um, most most of all the greats have been able to show that. It, like I often say that about actors, right? Yeah, actors can be great if they always kind of do the same kind of film. But I want to see an actor who can really do almost anything. And that's what Robin Williams was, right? He could he could win Academy Awards for deep dramatic roles, and then he could make us roll on the floor laughing in comedies. He could divert, he could do everything. <coughs> I would love to see uh, a Christopher Nolan diversify himself a little bit. Maybe do a comedy, maybe do an action adventure, maybe do something like that that doesn't have the deep, dark, serious, introspective, you know, deep tone. I'd like to see him try that um, and see how he does with it. I, I'd, be, I'd love to see it. Heavens, I'd love to see that. Anyway. While Christopher Nolan's tone and style I thought was absolutely bang on great for, for Batman, because and we all saw what he did with the Batman franchise, right? Just incredible. I don't know that that would fit with the larger DC a cinematic universe. Like, <clears throat> could you see Christopher Nolan directing a Flash character? Like, think about that for a second. I, I, I don't know that Flash, I think it would really fundamentally change Flash or Green Lantern. Um... His style would probably work really well with a John Jones, like with Martian Manhunter. Um, but I, I just don't think it would work with a lot of the other characters in that DC cinematic universe. And therefore, it's not a matter of, and I say this about actors all the time, sometimes it's not a matter of, does this guy have the, the enough talent to do something? Obviously, Christopher Nolan has all the talent in the world to do any movie he wants. But the question becomes, is it a right fit? Because not everybody is a great fit for everything. Daniel Day-Lewis is the greatest actor alive today. But do I think he'd be a good fit for a role in the next Jim Carrey comedy? Greatest perform greatest actor alive right now. But no, probably not a good fit to star alongside Jim Carrey in a Jim Carrey comedy. Um, and I think the same can be said right now for Christopher Nolan of doing a Justice League. So personally, uh, hey, don't get me wrong. If they announced tomorrow that Christopher Nolan was now stepping in to direct a Justice League movie, I'd be as excited and as interested and as fascinated as anybody. But I myself would not make that call. <coughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't personally make that just because I don't see it as a good fit. I think the DC a Justice League universe would be better served with a different type of director who inevitably probably won't be as talented of a director as Christopher Nolan, but whose style would probably fit the property better. That's all I'm saying. That, that's the only thing I'm, I'm thinking about. All right, let's move on to the next question. <coughs> and the next question today comes to us from Jimmy Bender. And Jimmy Bender writes, Hey guys and gals at AMC, I love your show. One of the things that I love about your show is that you show a true passion and joy about movies. You may have movies you dislike. You can really tell you love movies and convey that in your show. Well, thank you so much, Jimmy. Appreciate that. Unfortunately, that seems to be rare now. I listened to another movie review show and it seemed like he talked more about movies that he felt were awful more than any other movie he enjoyed. Do you feel that there is more negativity in the media now when talking about movies? Um, <clears throat> maybe. Um, and look, let's, let's make no mistake. I can be pretty negative too. When it's like, don't even get me going on Transformers Four, the Star Wars prequels, uh, whatever. I mean, I can be pretty negative too. But I mean, I do prefer using my time to celebrate the movies and what I love in them and, and things like that more than negativity. But to be fair to whoever the reviewer is you're talking about and some other film sites and, and, and uh, other film reviewers out there, um, complaining can be fun. Not just to do. C complaining and ranting can be fun. And it can be entertaining to listen to. I, I gotta tell you, <clears throat> some of the most popular stuff I've ever put up on YouTube I don't put up a ton of rants. I don't put up a lot of real negative things. Maybe, you know, one every month or one every couple of months as opposed to 20 positive things. But um, some of the most popular stuff I've done 
has been my angry rants on something. Somebody even took like I, I took a six month period of me ranting about stuff and put it into one YouTube video. And, and you can find it on YouTube. I can't remember who put it together, but if you you can look it up. It's called John Campion Rants or something like that. And it's embarrassing for me when I look at it because I look pretty damn silly, but whatever, it's fun, right? Um, <clears throat> and I think a lot of film critics know that, that you know, ranting and trashing on stuff is fun and ranting and trashing on stuff can be entertaining for other people to watch too. Um, so, and if they legitimately dislike something, like I'm not into lying, like don't trash on something if you secretly liked it. But if it's authentic and it's real and they watched a film and it, and it irked them in a certain way and they want to express that, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. I do it myself. Um, <coughs> I know other people do it as well. So yeah, me personally, I've got no problem with it and that's cool. Um, on AMC Movie Talk, you know, I, I've expressed this a lot of times. You know, Transformers comes out, Transformers 4, and it's a big pile of crap. It's awful. Just an awful movie. Um, but... You know, I won't get on AMC Movie Talk on the on its opening weekend and talk about how how awful it is. I'll wait for it to be in theaters for a couple of weeks because it's not my place <coughs> to dissuade anybody from going to see a certain movie. It's not my place. Um, there's a bit of a conflict of interest there. I've tried to explain this before. This is the one difference for somebody like me doing something for AMC and doing something for myself for like when I used to run the movie blog. AMC, um, you know, they're awesome. The integrity at AMC is incredible. They give me total creative and editorial control. What corporation is going to do that? And we maintain a church and state relationship. They do not interfere with what we do editorially at all. That being said, <coughs> I made the decision that... I want to honor that integrity that AMC has and that the trust that they show us by giving us complete editorial control to do whatever we want and say whatever we want. I made the decision that, you know what, AMC as a company, we have partnerships with these studios and, and it's a conflict of interest for me to get on my show and tell people don't go see this movie on its opening weekend. I may do that on my personal channels, I may do that on my Facebook page. I may do that on Twitter. I may do that on whatever. But when I'm on AMC's channel, I made the decision that we are not going to trash our partners' films on their opening weekends. <clears throat> now, that being said, heaven help you if you come to me and say, hey, John, I know you didn't like Transformers 4, but we got this deal with Paramount. Can, can you encourage people to go see it? Um, you better put on some body armor because I'm about to tear you apart. Uh, no, I won't do that. And I won't let my staff do that. I mean, if, if, my staff, if anybody else, if Dennis liked, which he doesn't, but if Dennis liked Transformers 4 and he wants to get on the show and say, hey, I saw Transformers 4 this weekend. I saw it opening night. And I loved it. That's great. That's fine if that's what he really thinks. <coughs> but... Um, you know, we won't, I won't do that. Um, I will never say something positive about a film that I don't like. And that's why in that opening week of Transformers, I stayed real quiet about it on its opening week. And I waited till its second or third week before I went, holy crap, that Transformers was awful. That was just awful. Otherwise, I'll stay quiet about it. Um, so, because that's just, that's the line I decided to draw. That's the line I decided that working with AMC and the relationships that AMC has and the partnerships that it has, that's the line that I felt was, this is appropriate. I'm not going to say I like something if I don't like it. I just won't do it. And now a lot of our AMC viewers have come to know that, oh my gosh, this big massive movie, like if Batman vs. Superman opens this week and John's not saying anything about it, AMC viewers know that that means John hated it. <laughs> so we're all kind of conditioned to that now. Um, but as far as the negativity goes of, of other sites, hey, look, I've got no problem with it as long as uh, it's authentic ne negativity. Uh, if some movie critic <coughs> really hated Transformers 4 and they do a half hour long rant that's funny and whatever, but really piling on the negativity, as long as it's authentic and real and that's what they really feel, then personally I have no, I have no problem with it. I, I, I personally have no problem with it. And eh, that's just me. All right. 
Uh, we're starting to run short on time, so I'm going to start flying through these uh, a little bit faster. We're going to get to the next question now. And the next question comes from Sean Hallen, who writes, Hey guys, love the show. Can't get enough. My question regards the upcoming film Serena, starring Jennifer Lawrence and Bradley Cooper. The film is due out is due to be released here in the UK on October 24th, but there is no trailer or advertisement for this film whatsoever. Should there be some sort of advertising by now? I don't want to say negative, but does this mean bad things for the film in terms of the studio's belief in it? I loved the chemistry of these two in Silver Linings Playbook and can't wait to see them work together again. Well, Sean, in case you haven't seen it, you can see Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence working together again in another film that's already out. <coughs> and uh, you can watch it on Netflix now or Amazon. Uh, American Hustle. They were together again in American Hustle. So this is, I believe this is their third film together. Some might, I got something in my head saying it might be their fourth. J tell me in the comment section if I'm right about that or if I'm wrong about that. Something in my head is telling me that Serena is actually um, going to be their fourth film together. Uh, I'm not uh, I'm not absolutely positive about that. But anyway, um, look, a lot of times people write to me and ask, Hey, John, we haven't seen a trailer for this yet. Should we be worried? And I'll say, dudes, the movie's not, it's still seven months away. No, don't worry about it. This film is supposed to open in the UK in two months. <coughs> still no teaser, still no trailer. If you go to the Internet Movie Data page for this film, actually, there is no release date listed for the United States. The, the release date for the United States simply says 2014. So, there's one of two ways to look at this. Either, number one, you can choose to be negative and, and think, this must mean the, 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 you know, that the studio doesn't believe in the film. Understandable why you could think that. But with the caliber of performers in this film, with the Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence, and knowing that they are in a position in their careers right now that they can be very picky about what films they're going to get involved in and what scripts they're going to approve, I choose to believe that right now that what is probably happening is that they don't have the film done. I mean, I believe they finished shooting it and all that kind of stuff, but I believe they're still probably really probably tinkering with it and working with it. Maybe the film's just not to where they want it to be yet. And therefore, they are hesitant to, to commit to a release date in North America. And you're right. October 24th is only two months away. Now, non-summer blockbuster films are different from films the rest of the year. Summer blockbuster films, you got to start getting that marketing out six months in advance. Or Christmas films, you got to start getting marketing out six months in advance. But for the rest of the year, I think two or three months is a pretty reasonable window. But we are getting into a very tight space for that window for this film. There should have been a teaser out by now. There should have been a trailer. There should have been a committed release date. If they are indeed releasing this movie in the U.S. in 2014, we're running out of 2014. You need to announce a release date soon. I got a feeling this film is going to be pushed to 2015. I have a feeling that it's going to be pushed internationally as well to 2015. So I don't think that necessarily means the movie is bad and they don't have faith in it. I simply believe it probably means they need the time and they're they're going to work on a little bit more okay uh two more questions left and then we're going to call it a day the second to last question today comes to us from nicholas and nicholas writes greetings and salutations amc movie talk crew my question is what is the next star wars in terms of nostalgia is guardians in 10 or 20 years going to be considered one of the greats in sci-fi thanks and keep it up don't know simply don't know it's one of those things where you just don't know until you have to see how it stands up to the passage of time. Like I even remember, look, Shawshank Redemption was one of my favorite films I'd ever seen the first day that I saw it. But even I didn't know how special of a film that was, probably until five, six, seven years later. When you realize how well it stands up and how special it is and how much it resonates with you and how much it stays in your consciousness and how much you refer to it back again and again and again and again and again. It's not until the passage of time that you really start to start to form an idea about what is this film's place in history. I think that's what we have to wait for. So, you know, to ask the question, is Guardians of the Galaxy the next great sci-fi film? Impossible to say, positively or negatively. I tend to think probably not. I love the movie. Seen it seven times in theaters now. But is it the next Star Wars? I can't say yes or no. I, that's ask me in three years 
If Guardians of the Galaxy is an afterthought in three years, then obviously no. If Guardians of the Galaxy starts to become one of those films that we start measuring all the other films against, like we do with Avengers, like we do for The Dark Knight, um, then maybe. Then maybe. But the reality is we need to wait a lot of years, a number of years at least at any rate, to really be able to be in a position where we can answer that. All right, folks, we're already over an hour, so I'm going to take this one last question. <coughs> and this last question comes to us from Joe Hogan, who writes, Hey, guys, love the show. Thanks so much, Joe. I was just wondering, with the passing of Robin Williams, can we see an autobiography movie of his life, of how he started, his ups and downs, and how it ended, possibly sometime in the near future? Thanks, and keep up the good work. Well, not to be morbid or anything, but I, I'm sure the moment that Robin Williams passed away, there are studios just doing their jobs, just doing their jobs, uh, that started scrambling to figure out how they could secure the rights to, to tell the life story of Robin Williams. Um, it wasn't all that long after Steve Jobs passed away that two different movie incarnations of his life got put into development. One's already come out, the one with Ashton Kutcher. And uh, another one is is still to be uh, is still to be done. I would be shocked <coughs> if within the next twelve months we don't hear that Sony has secured the rights to tell the biography of Robin Williams. Uh, they're planning on hiring so and so to write the script, and they're going to go into production late twenty fifteen. I would be shocked if by the maybe even by the end of the year if we don't hear some kind of announcement about somebody making plans to tell the Robin Williams story. When you read <coughs> anything about the life uh, of Robin Williams uh, and, and about the different things, I mean, look, if you just want something interesting, look up the relationship between Robin Williams and Christopher Reeves. Did you even know that they had a deep friendship? That they, there was a, there's a very unique relationship that Robin Williams and Christopher Reeves had that goes back to when they were in college. Look it up, it's fascinating. But Robin Williams has a lot of those types of stories in his life. A biography on Robin Williams would be fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Um, don't bother asking me, who do you think should play Robin Williams? Don't Please don't ask me that question. Who knows? doesn't matter. I would love to see it. And I think there are going to be people that are already working on wanting to tell the story. And I think the story of Robin Williams is one that should be told. So um, <clears throat> I'd be shocked if they didn't announce it really soon. And I fully expect that it's it's going to happen. All right, folks. Well, that will do it for this installment of AMC Mailbag. Thanks so much for joining me today. I want to remind you, lots of great movies playing in AMC theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and, of course, your movie ticket information. Once again, if you want to email in a question to get on another installment of Mailbag or perhaps on AMC Movie Talk, just Email us at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. And by the way, you can follow AMC Movie News on Twitter. Just follow us at AMC Movie News. So that'll do it for me for today. I'll be back again tomorrow being Sunday. Don't forget again, the Geeky Awards are going to be broadcast live. Go to twitch.tv slash the Geeky Awards to watch that tomorrow night. That's Sunday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, and uh, maybe you'll see us win. Maybe you'll see us lose, whatever. Should be a lot of a really fun show anywhere. Stan Lee's going to be there. Um, oh, um, Hurd's going to be there. Lamar Burton's going to be there. Uh, Manu Bennett is going to be there. It's going to be a really good show, so make sure you tune in and check that out. So that'll do it for me. So until next time, my name is John Campbell for AMC Movie News. Until then, bye-bye.